Oh man. All right. Jeez. What a pain in the ass yeah. doing it out here. I thought this was going to be a lot easier than uh, the doing it at the studio where I normally do it at. Yeah. Yep. Um, Chance Leak. I'm the founder and veteran uh, president of Recoil Outdoor. In a world filled with billions of people, there are countless untold stories waiting to be discovered. These untold stories hold the power to inspire, educate, and connect us. Whether you're interested in media, automotive, or just here for a good story, welcome to the Underline Podcast. I guess we can start with the basics. Are you from here? I'm originally from Sepulpa. So where is that? <laughs> just southwest of Tulsa, kind of the outskirts of Tulsa. Okay. So a little went to a little public school called Kiefer. Kiefer. Yep. So I mean, graduating class had like forty six in it. Oh wow. So okay. Small. Similar story. I grew up in a really <laughs> small town in Idaho, and I think my graduating class was like thirty. Yeah, yep, town yep. population was like ninety five hundred. But Jeez. we didn't have a metro that we were attached to like Tulsa. Uh our nearest town or city, I guess, was about forty five minutes away. Yeah. So Tulsa's probably a good twenty, twenty five minutes away to get down into like Metro Tulsa. Okay. So that's so, pretty similar. Yep. Yep. Oh no. Oh, what'd you do to this? Uh it rode in a <laughs> Dodge truck all the way here. <laughs> Trying to get me on the podcast, trying yeah, to set me big. up, <laughs> trying to punk me. That's not cool. Probably set myself up. <laughs> yeah, let's see if yours does it. Nope, we're all good. Oh, you got the you got the full blooded Dr Pepper, the no holds oh, barred. Yeah. Man, I've been on a gym kick lately, and I'm like paranoid about sugar. <laughs> so you grew up in Sepulpa. How long were you there for? Oh, I left Sepulpa. I think in 2016 or 17. So I got home from basic training in uh, 2016. Okay. And what was it? It was like, I'd say it was 2016. It was like early 2016. Worked in a couple shops there in Tulsa and Bixby and then uh, moved out on our farm in Enid. Oh, okay. Your family's farm? Yeah, we've got a centennial farm over in Enid. So what is a centennial farm? It's a farm that's been registered in Oklahoma that's been in the family for like over a hundred years, like been a farm for over a hundred years in Oklahoma. Oh, wow. So it's where like my great grandfather, great great grandfather grew up. Old farmhouse is still there. That's crazy. So, a lot of history there, but yeah, we still have family there. So I moved over there for a little bit. Okay. So what kind of got you away from the, the farm life? Um, well, I was working oil field for like 12 bucks an hour and I got a job offer at the airport for 17 an hour. <laughs> How do you work oil field for 12 an hour? Everyone I know that's ever done oil field, like, comes home a millionaire. So I didn't work as, like, a – I do, like, roustabout stuff. Yeah. I worked for, like, a mom and pop shop. Uh, <clears throat> so we did crane service, uh, moving pumping units around, such like that. We didn't do, like, well work, such like that. Okay, so, so kind of more basic, unskilled stuff. Yep, yep. And this uh, was – you were about how old when you started doing this? Heck, I would have been 20, 21. Okay. So I you were it's... you were a late enlister. Well, I enlisted at 17. So that would have been put... My math is all jacked up. So were you a guard then? Yep. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Yep. Okay. So you enlisted when you were 17. So you mm -hmm. just did the weekend deal, work day jobs. Yeah. So I did the weekend deal two weeks out of the month. Uh, okay. when we would have active orders. You know, also I would volunteer, went to South Carolina a couple times, stuff like that. That's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it wasn't, was it? <laughs> You're right. I got to travel a little bit, so. Okay, that's cool. Uh, you get to deploy? Yeah, so we deployed, oh, we started mobilization late 2019. Hold on, let's back up. What branch were you in? Army National Guard. Army, okay, so you're Army Guard. What mm -hmm. was your MOS for all the... So my I don't MOS, want to call them crayon eaters because that's Marines, but, you know. Yeah, I mean, not jarheads either. I, Paint I don't know. chip eaters? Sure. 
Uh, so I was a 15 Delta, which is aviation powertrain technician. I worked on rotor heads and helicopters. Okay. 47s, you know, Chinooks, mm-hmm. Apaches, Blackhawks. Something kind of crew chief adjacent, a little um, more specialized. It was it was more of a back shop. So, oh, okay. So like a crew chief, they would actually go out there and be able to work on the helicopter. They would they hot were, swap parts and then the buses stuff they take to your back shop where you could then refurbish it, the parts. Right. Tear okay. it down, rebuild it, inspect it. Okay. So we did a lot of bearings and seals. Gotcha. Uh, measuring stuff down to like the fourth decimal decimal point kind of thing. Yeah. So um so that was my job. Um I, I also got put on the DART team, the down aircraft recovery team. When is that? <clears throat> so if a helicopter or a drone ever went down out in the field, we were there to retrieve it. Oh. Um, luckily, that never happened. That So we were like, QRF was first on the scene. Okay. We would come in after them, after the aircraft's been blown up, after, you know, everybody's gotten out. When the dust settles and you got to bring what's left back. Right. Okay. That's what we would end up doing. Um, okay. So we trained a lot for this. Uh we did nothing while we were over there for that. <laughs> Man, that's a really common theme with the military is like train until you know it better than your language mm-hmm. and then you never use it. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like our mobility exercises, uh, me being Air Force and um, having a background in, uh, we're called aerospace ground equipment maintainers, but essentially I was a diesel tech. Mm-hmm. I mean, I had to know... HVAC, I had to know turbine and a few other things, pneumatic systems, stuff like that. They kind of accompanied the systems that we worked with. But um, we would learn how to do all these like weird measurements for how to like get our equipment in a C-130 or a helicopter or something. And we'd learn how to prep it all for mobility and all this mm-hmm. stuff uh, for like last minute operations, you know, like real urgent stuff where right. they need support equipment for like an emergency aircraft dispatch for a mission. Dude, I don't think we ever did that, ever. (laughs) I think we had no less than six months heads up for every mobility. So it's like we didn't have to do like this janky last minute stuff like we trained for. It was so relaxed. Yep. yep. It was probably smooth every time you did it. Yeah. Yep. I mean, we we had time to triple, quadruple check everything. And it was just like, oh, yeah, I get like three or four units prepped a day. And, you know, by the time we're, we're getting close, you'll be done. And then we'll have time to quadruple check everything. And. You know, yeah. we're training like the Middle East is going to catch on fire and everyone's going to point at the U.S. It's like, no. It's crazy how that happens. It's so <laughs> stupid, yeah. But, you know, I, at the same time, I'd rather train for, you know, the worst case scenario and then never use it. It makes your yeah. day-to-day a lot easier. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, that was our <clears throat> our hardest thing we had to train for was the DART team while we were in mobilization. Okay. Like, that was the box we had to check was making sure we can get the aircraft off the ground if it ever went down. And we trained all over Fort Hood on that. Oh, wow. I mean, we were, that was our main mission was make sure the art team is, can do what they need to do. Okay. So how does that play in with your actual MOS? Is that like a special duty that you do on the side or like, cause typically you kind of have one role in the military, right? You have your MOS and if you get farmed out to a special duty that kind of overrides your MOS and you're focused on that and only that, you don't really do two things. So... It's kind of weird because we had shops, like the individual shops knew their job. Right. And their specific job pertained to a certain position on the helicopter. Right. So they may know that part of the helicopter better than the next person. Um, so for me, work on rotor heads, I knew the pickup points, the tie down spots, such like that. It was more of let's learn the the generic terms of the helicopter, like where we can pick pick points and lift this thing, sling load it, such like that. You know, actually focusing on other portions of the helicopter. Um, and then, you know, if you're really training and you actually have to go out in the field, I'd assume it'd be like, Hey, we've got a mission back shop, you know, continue doing what you're doing, but pull this one guy out of that shop, send him, you know, and so you pull that makes sense. an individual from every shop. So where does training for that fit in? It doesn't really. <laughs> Interesting. So is it like you send one person off the training one day and then they get that done and the shop operates or is it like the shop shuts down everyone goes so when we were doing training you know before deployment we'll say we would do um uh, so for m day sh- soldiers which were like the the weekend warriors mm-hmm. which is what i was we would have to make time like during the month like in, during the week kind of thing and come in and do like a solid week of training or and you get put on active orders for that right 
money. Yes. <laughs> Especially <laughs> when you make it 12 bucks an hour. I'd much rather go do that. <laughs> oh, yeah. And it's training. That's not real work. Yeah. So, um, but I mean, there again, that only happened a couple of times. Yeah. We actually really trained this when we were gearing up for mobilization. Okay. We had, we had a CH-47 out on the flight plane that had no rotor heads or anything on it. And we tried to sling load it once. And it actually twisted the airframe a little bit and uh, stretched stretch the sling load ropes. So I actually had to punch it off. So now, I mean, it's still sitting on a flight line. And I've been in or I was in for eight and a half years and it's still sitting there. <laughs> what, what years were you in? Just so people have kind of context. I was in from August August of 2014 to February of 21. Okay. Okay. So um, I was in for a good minute. Yeah. I have to say that I was done. <laughs> yeah, definitely. For me, I mean, I was in from 12 to 19 and that's like, yep. I don't know how people do 20 anymore. Like with how political shops are and how it's it's gotten away from like, do your job, be good at your job, know your job. And if somebody below you is not doing their job, then make them do their job. Mm -hmm. It's gotten away from that to now everything is so PC and it's like you can't correct people like you used to be able to yes. if there was a problem. And it's just. It changed so much even when I was in. Like I heard a while back that, you know, your first was it the two weeks of basic training is red phase, right? Well, I guess the privates were complaining because drill sergeants had a right, right shoulder patch. Yeah. To me, that's earned. Like that's you've you've seen some stuff. You don't, you know, you earn that. Yeah. And they complain enough that now they get a go army patch after two weeks of red face. I'm what? Like, what the heck? Like, no, <laughs> man. People who get like any kind of VA rating, if they get hurt in basic training, that to me is a joke. Oh, same. It's same. like you got hurt. You didn't make it. You didn't make. You failed. Yeah. You don't. It, Yep, yep. Good effort, but yeah, I mean, save that stuff for the guys that earn it, you know? Yeah. I think if you can't complete your first four years, I, combat aside, mm -hmm. you know, granted, if you're like a PJ and you're two years in and right. first mission goes to hell, that's not really on you, but, yeah, you know, just... <sighs> yeah, it's an irritating thing. I mean, there was several factors that played into me getting out and, uh, you know, like... I came into my reenlistment window when I was overseas. So my E7 pulled me aside and it's like, hey, your your reenlistment window, 20,000 tax free Ooh. sign on bonus. Oh. And I was like, I, I accidentally laughed. And he goes, Well, I kind of figured that you were gonna say no, but that confirmed it. It's like, yeah, I'm I'm done. And you know, I I have no regrets on that at yeah. all. You know, yeah, it was twenty thousand tax free, but money comes and goes. <laughs> <laughs> that it does that it does so and yeah ironically enough i make probably well okay we'll say when when this year was going well and when i was busy uh i think i made over triple what i did when i was enlisted yep yep so i believe it well that, that was my big thing it's like man that to me the military's holding me back from everything i want to do every weekend that there's something going on drill yeah you know every, every time i want to go do something that would better myself drill <laughs> <laughs> for me, like one of the worst things about being enlisted for me personally was how they treated your time. Um, so, I mean, I would get to the shop at 630 and then usually I was out by four. But like, let's say it's Friday. We are done with Friday cleanup at 130. <sighs> Maintenance is caught up. Everything is good. And we're like, hey, can we leave? And they're like, no, you need to stay till five. And it's like, okay, what are we going to do? Clean. We did that. Everything is clean. Stay if you can find something for us to clean, we'll stay. <laughs> right. And they just, they hold you there and we stand there and we do nothing. So feeling like a prisoner and just having my time taken away from me like that gives me so much anxiety. Same. That now I don't know if I can work a job where it's like a fixed hour salary kind of thing. Like, I don't know if I can do that. That would make me so, I'd be staring at the clock just feeling panicked. You know, between that and the oil field job I had really taught me the value of time and a yeah. dollar. Yeah. Like the, the both hand in hand because I'm sitting there at drill and, you know, that was back in the day when I was just full blown cars, had a motorcycle. I was racing on the drag strip and my unit was like a quarter mile away from the drag strip. So I'm, occasionally I'm at drill here in these top fuel dragsters going down the track and oh, I'm, I'm like, 
I just want to go to the track right now. Right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, oh. I'm sitting there drill instead doing absolutely nothing. Got a PMCS, a truck that's been not driven for a month, you know, or it's been driven around the block. Okay, hey, everything works. <laughs> uh, that's terrible. But, yeah, I mean, it. there is a lot of stuff that made me want to get out. Oh, yeah. So It's not a difficult decision these days. No. Um. Okay, so you were in from... You said 14 to 21? Mm-hmm. Okay. And so you, after that, you got a job at, was it Will Rogers? So I got that job at Will Rogers early 2019. Okay. So, so that probably was probably your... four months before deployment. Okay. So it was like your new day job. Yes. Okay. So, and that transition from, <clears throat> they hired me on as an aviation mechanic and the uh, vice president of quality over there got word that I could do NDT. That was my secondary, not secondary MOS. It was a portion of my primary MOS in the what military. What is NDT? Non-destructive testing. So <laughs> Okay, so that's the Air Force equivalent of NDI. Non-destructive yes, yes, inspection. NDI. That's, okay. We went by a lot of Air Force standards. Okay. Um, so I did that, and he got wind of it that I did in the military, and I'd already been through the schools. I was qualified, but I wasn't certified. Mm. So being that I've had the 80-hour class and all of the – not all of the class. I had two methods that I had the class in. Um, he's like, man, we just had two guys quit. We really need a guy. I was like, well, I mean, I, I'd be interested to see what it would be. Right. He goes, let me make you an offer. Oh. It's like, okay. You know, I'm already making, I went, jumped from the $12 an hour to 17 an hour. I had more hours here with what I felt was like less work. I enjoyed it a lot more. Right. And uh, he bumped me up from the 17 an hour to 27 an hour oh, man. i was like done good stuff <laughs> yeah that's a solid number yeah so i went from that and uh i locked in that job made sure you know all my ducks were in a row and then we went overseas at the end of that year okay so and they held your job aren't they like legally obligated to so i think yes but in this instance it was weird there was a fine line there so we deployed and then COVID hit and AAR, which I worked for, let go furloughed. I think it was like 30% of people. So we had a big furlough there. I mean, AAR is a big corporate industry. You know, we're working on Boeing 737s. There's a ton of people. We have locations all around the U S so 30% of people is a lot for what we had. Yeah. Um, they let one of the guys go in our shop that was, I mean, he had been there, I don't know, 10, 12 years probably. Oh, wow. But since I was overseas, they kept my job. Oh, I, nice. I technically wasn't costing him any money. <laughs> but they did pay the difference of what I was making overseas to what I'd be making here. Mm. So uh, for six months at least, there was, they helped me out a lot there. Okay. Uh, so I was, when I got back, I was like, yeah, I'm keeping my job there. It's solid. You know, it's job security for one. They took care of me while I was overseas. You know, I'm, I'm sick with it. And uh, <clears throat> so I got home and unfortunately I worked there for like six months and then they mandated the vaccine. Yeah. And I was like, you know what? I, I'm gone. <laughs> yeah. That's uh, so many federal agencies just put a lot of people at a really difficult crossroads. It's compromised your health potentially, mm -hmm. at least your morals or keep your and keep your job or it's like you have to figure something else out, but having that kind of skill set, mm -hmm. it's like, where do you go? You know, how many private companies are there that aren't going to do that? You know, Boeing right. did it. Um, I think pretty much anything, if you, unless you're able to do like some kind of private maintenance for somebody, like somebody who owns a fleet of jets or something. And well, at the time it was big to mandate everything. Yeah. So, you know, all the companies were mandating the vaccine. Black Rifle Coffee did it. See, that's nuts to me. That is the biggest, like, just... What's the word I'm looking for? It's not uh, hypocritical. Yeah. Because yeah. they're all like, America, yeah, you know, veterans, yeah. And then they're going to mandate the vaccine, like, really, dude? Yeah. Yep, yep. That's very uh, big government of you to do that. <laughs> and granted, like, I kind of get it because the government is twisting their arm to do that. That's not their idea. That's not what they believe in. But, like, surely you could have figured something out. Right. Well, what's weird to me is 
there was a lot of, um, I wouldn't say gray areas, but some of those companies, coffee companies were essential. Yeah. So I feel like they had some pull there, you know, some weight they could have stood on, but yeah. I would have I mean, talked to the CPA and been like, cool, you are all 1099. You all own your own businesses <laughs> and yep, I'm going yep. to do business with you and right. I would like you to run my store. Yep, like <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> you can do something, I'm sure. Yeah. But no, and, and you know, I'm not against the, if anybody else wants to get the vaccine, like by all means, go get it. Just don't force me to go get it. Yeah. You know? I'm curious. Like, please go get it. I want to see what happens to you. <laughs> I want to see if you grow like a second yeah. nose or something. Right. <laughs> But well, it was cool about it. I say cool. I got COVID when I was overseas mm-hmm. and on an installation of, we'll say 1500 people, we had 830 something people in quarantine at a time. And I went in cause I had strep throat, like, ah, oh, it's going to be a symptom of COVID. So we'll just go ahead and put you in, in quarantine. Mm-hmm. Well, they quarantined us in a co-ed tent with 20 other people and didn't test us till like four days later. Well, of so, course yeah, I got it now. Everybody got Yeah. <laughs> So, um, but I saw it go from like 800 something people and three months later, COVID ran its course. We had probably 20, 30 people in, in quarantine. Oh, wow. So it, for me, I saw it on like a small town level of what it's going to do. And it's going to run its course and be done. Yeah. You know, and a couple people might get it here and there, kind of like the flu, any flu, everybody's, you know, you're going to get it again at some point kind right. of thing. So that really kind of struck me wrong whenever I got home. The mandate was like. I've seen what's gonna do. Like I, yeah. I kind of felt like in the back of my mind, I had some sort of idea there. Yeah, you kind of just ran through a small scale simulation, right? Yeah. So and now nobody's talking about it. No, it's, it's like not even a thing. <laughs> you know, there's no more. Do they even do the rapid test deals anymore? I have do no they even idea. ask you like, oh, have you had like these? Because you know, you used to walk into urgent care and they'd be like, oh, do you, have you had these symptoms in the last seventy two hours? And like masks walking into hospitals. Because, you know, with my, the stuff I do now, walking to the hospitals, I see the station set up. Mm-hmm. There's nobody manning the station. Like, the masks are available for you. There's hand sanitizer there. And there's, like, the, the sheets you would fill out if you've had COVID. Yeah. But they're just sitting there. Yeah. It used to be, like, the second you open the door, somebody was yelling at you to put a mask on. Like, yeah. immediately. And now, yeah, I mean, they, some places have the station. Some places don't. Like, it never even happened. Right. Yeah. So. It's nuts. Yeah, I don't know. COVID was a weird deal. The way that it worked. And I, like, I read something that there was a patent filed on the vaccine for it, like, years before it ever happened. It's crazy. So it's like, dude, <laughs> like there, if, if there, there ever was a crazy time to be alive, just the level of mistrust with the government and all the crazy oh, yeah. stuff. Uh, okay, well, I don't need this to be a conspiracy <laughs> podcast. I could <laughs> we could dive about into this forever. forever yeah, yeah. <laughs> I guess that just goes hand in hand with being a veteran. Because we, <laughs> if anybody knows not to trust the government, it's yep, us. yep, it's exactly. Us. Gotta watch out for the big green weenie. It'll get you every time, <laughs> every time. <laughs> yep. So, um, let's talk a little bit about your not business. Okay, about your nonprofit. So, Recoil Outdoor. What is it? Obviously, I know what it is, but for everybody who's interested in you and the message and mm-hmm. what you're looking to achieve, what is Recoil? So Recoil is a veteran nonprofit that provides veterans and first responders with outdoor recreational therapy. We do this by putting butts in seats, put them in behind the wheel of an off-road capable rig, whether it's overlanding or we- weekend wheeling trip, get them into the outdoors, get them around other veterans people have been there done that and understand what it's like and just enjoy life like we don't we don't need to go out and do some mundane program and bureaucratic program like the va does that's not what it's about it's about just getting out enjoying life and like just living happily like i I don't need to go through all the you know therapy I, i hate using the word the term therapy but that's essentially what it is just not as professional Right. So I kind of see it as, so this is something like, unless you have a specialty vehicle already set up for it, which you're already going to know what overlanding off-roading is. If you do have a vehicle that's capable of doing it, it's being able to experience that for the first time without making the investment of time and money to achieve that. Because as we both know, it takes a lot to make this happen, um, especially to the level that you do it. And I can remember back to a time where I was transitioning out 
And that was just a really weird, turbulent time for me. I didn't have a job lined up. I was med boarded without really much of a heads up. And I had no direction in life. Like everything was up in the air. Finances had no idea what was going to happen. My relationship at the time was on the rocks and just like everything was scary and bad. And it's, I'm thinking back to like, if there was a weekend where I could just, you know, have a Saturday with the boys and just go get away from everything Mm -hmm. and just clear my head and not worry about that. Like even for a day, my mental health would have been a thousand times better. And that's, that's all that we're about. Like, so when I got home from deployment, I'll give you a little backstory. Um, I got home and I had my sister move in with me, my little sister. She hasn't had much like life experiences at the time. Mm -hmm. It's like, Hey, move in. I've got two other bedrooms. Go get you a job, like figure out life. But I need somebody in the house because I don't know how it's going to be whenever I get home. It's like, I've heard horror stories. I just don't know. The shit will just sneak up on you. And and it does. And and I found myself like in the middle of my kitchen yelling at my sister for no apparent reason, like leaving the light switch on or something. I'm like, man, this isn't me. Yeah. You know, and I I sank $10,000 into my motorcycle while overseas. And every time I'd hopped on when I got home, I didn't enjoy it. So I sold that for a boat. And then I sold the boat. And then I got the waggy. And the waggies what provide me my outlet. Yeah. So, I mean, I found a lot of just mental health situations that I knew was not me. Like being very self-aware, mm-hmm. I knew it wasn't me. And so, um, just it being, would kind of happen on autopilot, and then afterwards you have this weird moment of sobriety. Like, what just happened? Like, who yeah. was? I don't do that. My subconscious was definitely giving off other signs that was not me. Yeah. <laughs> so I ended up going and getting help. Um, I had a a girlfriend at the time that was like, Hey, you know, I've been through some depression stuff. Maybe you ought to go to the VA and see what they can do. Yeah. So I went to the VA and I mean, they put me on medication just as you would expect. You know what the VA does. They just throw pills at people. Yep. So, um, I was like, you know, I I don't want, I don't want pills. I've never taken pills in my life. Like I, I don't like it, but if I need to, you know, help me manage, like give me the lowest dosage possible. Right. You know, and the the better stuff that's not going to completely twist my brain around kind mm-hmm. of thing. So um, I did that and it helps me maintain. I think it, it can be good just to pump the brakes and all the weird shit mm-hmm. so you can stop and you can figure out what's going on. And that way you're level headed. If you do need to go seek treatment, it kind of just makes everything stop for a minute so you can get a handle on it. Exactly. Um my son, he had real crazy behavioral issues when I got custody of him. And we kind of took that route where it's like, he's in fight or flight mode constantly. And he can't think about what he's doing. He can't learn lessons. He doesn't understand anything. He just has this knee jerk reaction to certain things. Mm -hmm. So I had to, you know, make sure he had medication prescribed to kind of slow everything down and make it so he's not reacting to everything. So he can see what he's doing and kind of learn the behaviors Mm -hmm. And, uh, this year we kind of found that he was in a spot to where I felt like he was mature enough and he had coping skills and he was self-aware. So we were actually able to transition him off of the medicine completely. And he's been doing great. That's awesome. Yeah. He's holy shit. He has terrible ADHD and a few other, you know, three, four letter (laughs) diagnoses, but Mm -hmm. holy shit, he has so much energy now. It's insane. Sometimes I'm like, man, do I have any medicine left? Like you're being (laughs) really loud today. (laughs) No, no, but yeah, I mean, it's, it can be a useful tool. So I'm not ripping on people who take medicine for, you know, whatever issue you have. That's the way I'm like, back in the day, I would never even thought I would be on any antidepressant medication at all. Like I, before deployment, I was the most resilient person I knew. I was just happy go lucky. I was doing my thing. Didn't really pay attention to much. And then I got home and I was like, yeah, I've, I've totally changed. Like I could just see it. And other people were telling me like, hey, man, you didn't need to blow up like that. I'm like, oh, I did. What the heck? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like it had just had to catch myself in a lot of scenarios. Yeah. So, so you feel like that kind of levels you out a little bit? Yeah. I mean, I'd notice it whenever like I just need to learn something like mm-hmm. sitting down and put my mind to focus like. It's just enough that's like I can concentrate. Okay. You know, I don't have 20 bazillion things going on in my head. I don't go zero to a hundred real fast. You know, okay. it's, it was like flip of the switch and I was just irate. Yeah. I was yelling and whatnot. I was like, man, that's not me. I don't right. yell. Like what the heck? <laughs> yeah. So. Being what we're put through and our expectations and our life experiences. I don't know what about that 
universally makes people react that way. There'd be some really interesting psychology to kind of look into, but it mm -hmm. seems to be a pretty universal truth. Yep. Like you talk to pretty much anybody who's done six plus years and who's deployed and done all that, and you, you find we we got some quirks. Yep. Yep. It, it's crazy too because if you're a veteran, like you can spot it in other veterans. Oh yeah, hundred like, percent. Anybody that's been in the military, it's like yeah, I, I know that quirk. I, yeah, I've done that. <laughs> yep. You know? Not even that, but just people's demeanors, like the way they stand or the way they talk, you know, they carry like, themselves. Yeah. Yep. Yep. It's kind of a weird thing. So anyways, back to recoil. Um, so kind of what are you planning right now? Like what direction is recoil headed in? Because you mentioned you want to get people out on the trails and out engaged in these things. Are you going to do that by like one-on-one -on -one experiences or big group events or kind of what are you, how, uh, words, you know? <laughs> um, so no I, i'm picking up what you're putting down okay um so my ultimate goal is i don't want to do events um i like events they're cool right um ultimately i would have one event a year and that would be more of a fundraiser get awareness out you know get more of an outreach um you know prep like the public for what we're doing because that's that's how you reach the public is doing stuff in public um my goal is to do this kind of behind the scenes. Um, a group of 12 to 13 veterans, put them in, in behind the wheel and let's go on a trip. Okay. You know, and we just capture that. Capture the moments of what we're doing and enjoy the camaraderie and, you know, maybe you taught some life skills along the way or, you know, make friends along the way like it that's that's all i really want to do is just trips mostly okay so um, like a one or two day overlanding trip and then throw some trails in there to get everybody you know experience wheeling and yeah stuff like that. and so overlanding is kind of in my eyes overused um it's really just a Even vehicle just, assisted adventure yeah i mean that's pack up for a camping trip really yes exactly that's what overlanding yeah is. <laughs> this is using your vehicle to camp yep so uh but i want to throw in some wheeling with that like right. You know, so like Colorado, like I right now I have a five night, six day trip mapped out in the San Juan Mountains. Oh wow. Of nothing but camping and you know, don't see town for days at a time. Yeah. You know? And so that's really what I want to do is just build a travel and really with friends and the enjoyment of knowing that I'm making a difference. Yeah. That's what heals me. So Yeah. It's a <laughs> the impact that you can provide is almost better than it, you need money to live. You need money to be able to access some of the things that guide you down the life that you want, mm -hmm. but the money isn't the happiness. Mm -hmm. It's the impact and it's the fulfillment that you can provide. Exactly. I found that with my work. Like there's a point where it's like, if I make 150,000 a year, I'm, I'm doing great. I'm able to put away a ton of money, invest some, have all the equipment that I want. If I make 150,000 and if I make 200 million, I don't think there will be a shred of difference in my happiness. The number in my bank account just looks different. I, I have no interest in owning a mansion, a Bugatti. Like, see, that's me. Like, I, I love supercars. They're, they're freaking awesome. They're but, cool to look at. I don't yeah, ever want to own one. Me neither. Uh, I, I, and same with my house. Like, Three hundred, four hundred thousand dollar houses in Oklahoma, but yeah, not perfect. other states. Like those are cool, yeah. But I don't need to own one, right? <laughs> you know, um, and really speaking, Oklahoma, three or four hundred thousand dollar houses. I mean, it's a a decent house these days. I feel like that's upper middle class, and that's like right on the brink of bougie, but it's it's just enough for a family, right? Right? Yeah, because stuff like you know the rental where I'm at. Mm -hmm. Um, if I was to buy something pretty parallel to this which i've been in the market for it's roughly about 400 yep, yep so i feel like 400 is where you want to be if you have a family 500 starts to get a little bit lavish yeah yep i'm but there it's, it's just crazy the economy there because i was looking whenever i was deployed I, it was when i bought my house i bought mine sight unseen while i was overseas yeah and uh I asked the bank, I was like, how much am I approved for? Like, you know, obviously I just came off that oil field job, so I wasn't making much. They're like, well, 274. So I started right. looking at those just to see like what what it would look like. Right. And it was a pool in the backyard, my own bar in the backyard. Hell yeah. You know, the TV <laughs> and fireplace going. I was like, yeah. man, this is awesome. But now that like $224,000 ain't buying you that. 
<laughs> no, uh-uh. now you're back at the 400 mark again. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, the house that I had in Deer Creek that I own, it was the first uh, property I ever bought. Um, I bought it for 265 The house is two years old. It was a Tabor. Um, it wasn't huge. It was 1650 square feet, but I sold it for 300 plus. I'll say that. I won't say the exact number, but it was way more than it was worth. And so for a small 1600 square foot house to go for like 320, 330-ish, mm-hmm. somewhere in that neighborhood, it's just obscene. Like you're knocking on the door for 400 and it's just real estate is, oh my God. Yep. A whole nother topic. <laughs> yeah. It makes me want to throw up. The economy sucks. The government sucks. Yep. Yep. Let's hit the trails. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care politics. I don't care who's in office. Let's just go enjoy each other's company on the trails. Right. Like, let's go have some fun. Tear, yeah. tear some the, stuff up. If the president could drop diesel, I'd appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> I found that one out today. <laughs> right. No, it came down a lot. Did it? I haven't paid attention because I haven't had a diesel in a while. Dude, it's been like 480 something forever. Yeah. I filled up for 395 yesterday. That's not it's bad. It's down almost a dollar. I saw, uh, I went to South Carolina to pick up the other TJ for a recoil. I saw two, was it 219? Other, other TJ? No, the, the TJ, I guess. Oh, okay. Um, But yeah, when I went to go pick that up, it was, did I say South Carolina? I think so. I meant West Virginia. Same thing. <laughs> uh, tomato, tomato. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think I saw 219. I was like, this is unreal. For diesel? No, no, no oh, gas. That's still stupid cheap. I mean, yeah. even now after the drop, I think it's still 270 something. Yeah. I, I was very impressed. I was like, I, I could stay up here for a few more days. <laughs> Damn, let's go move out there. Yeah. <laughs> it's so beautiful out there too. Oh, it is. Like, it's gorgeous. Everyone makes it sound like just sweaty, humid hick town and it's so pretty. You got to get away from like Nashville. Nashville's yeah. cool to visit. I could never live there. No, it's it's insane. I'm super sorry <laughs> for anybody who's in that area, but Nashville kind of gives me the ick. <laughs> Same. <laughs> yeah, and it's also kind of a lock your door, load your Glock kind of situation. Too. Yes, yes. I drove through there because my son, when he lived in this, his mom they were in Georgia, so I would drive through that area to go to. They were like an hour south of Atlanta, mm-hmm. so I had to drive through there and. Ugh. I could live over near uh, Lynchburg. How far is that? It's, was it an hour 45 south of Nashville? Okay. So. I've heard of that town before. I don't know why. Probably because that's where old number seven is distilled. I don't think I've really drank that. Jack Daniels? Oh, Jack Daniels. Yeah, I'm an idiot. Um, Yeah, I've definitely had Jack Daniels. Yeah. No, I wouldn't know of it because I'm, I'm not a big drinker. Like, I've been... S- Sober, sober for, man, probably three years now. Oh, that's awesome. Heck yeah, yeah. It's just, you know, I used to drink to kind of cope. I don't know. I just, it was excessive and mm-hmm. I got to a point where I was just tired of it. I was tired of feeling like shit all the time and yep, yep. like that being the main thing that I look forward to. It's like, oh, yay. I can't wait to go home and do this and then feel like shit tomorrow. It's like, why am I doing this? And then it got to the point where I drank a lot of wine just to like relax after mm-hmm. a long day. And then I'm like, man, all the calories in this, like sugar, <laughs> like what? No. And so I just cut it all out. I'm like drinking yeah. in any capacity never makes me feel good. I've never once said, oh man, I wish I got shit faced yesterday. Yep. Me neither. So but- it's like, why do I do it's money? It, I'm spending money to make myself feel bad. Like how stupid is that? Right. Right. I'm not I'm, knocking I'm on right you with you. If you're like a whiskey aficionado or whatever, you collect the stuff, you're casual drink. I'm not bashing you for that. I'm just saying me personally, it makes me feel like crap and I'm spending money on that and I just can't justify it. Yeah. See, I'm one that like once in a while, I'll have a glass of whiskey. Yeah. And I'll go chill by a campfire kind of thing. Yeah. But There's always the campfire exception. Yeah. But drinking doesn't count if there's a campfire. Exactly. (laughs) A beer, a beer at the guys, like I'll have a beer at the guys kind of thing. Yeah. But I, I don't, I don't get plastered. No. Like, at all. I think I've been plastered once. Yeah. And I was like, ah, this ain't for me. Right. <laughs> it's not good. But, yeah, no, I'm the same way. I hate spending money on alcohol. Like, all the free alcohol, okay, I'll throw it over in the liquor cabinet and stay there for <laughs> whoever comes and drinks it next. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> but, no, I, I do like whiskey. Like, I'll I'll go and find, you know, Oklahoma whiskey or whatever and collect a couple of them and whatnot. But, okay. Yeah, I don't ever, I can't 
same with you. Like I can't drink to cope. Yeah. I mean, it's not. A I good was scared habit. to get into that rabbit hole whenever I got home, honestly. Like that was something that I was I heard so many horror stories. I was like, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. There's a lot of people who dig that hole and can't climb mm-hmm. out. My yeah. uncle has been fighting alcohol addiction since he was like 20, and I think he's in his mid-50s now. It's insane. Still goes to AA meetings. He's been doing that for like 20 years, and mm-hmm. every day he said he has to like wake up and fight and choose not to have a drink. So that's insane. There's just some part of his brain that just tells him he has to, and he has to actively fight against it. So, And that can be something that's developed. That's not something that you're born with. You know, It's something that can be created. Mm-hmm. That psychological dependency on the sub <clears throat> on the substance, and right. yeah, it's just bad. So just don't don't even open that door. Yep, yep, um, absolutely. So let's talk about the poster child for recall. The waggy. What is the waggy? So I've had people. I've actually like brought it up in conversation with less than a handful of people, mm-hmm. and they're like, "Oh, what is it?" And I'm like, "You know what?" I don't know what the chassis is. It's a weird looking <laughs> wagon. I mean, obviously, but so it's it's all Jeep. Is it a Jeep? Okay, so I thought it was like an older Jeep chassis, yep. but it's just you know the wood panel. Uh, they call them an old Woody. That's what they call them, but it's an old okay. wood panel wagon. Is it like sixties? It's a seventy six. Seventy six. So they, I can't remember what year they started making those, but they ranged all the way up to eighty nine. Okay. So they, in the Cherokee, the XJ, uh, kind of did a spinoff of that. And that was the next generation of basically the Wagoneers. Okay. So, yeah, it's a 1976 Jeep Wagoneer. Ah. Uh, and then okay. the front end has actually been switched out. The grill and everything's been changed out to the Gladiator style grill. That's probably why it's so unrecognizable for me because it's not the complete OEM package you've Right. <laughs> it, and it's got one ton axles and GM drivetrain kind of stuff. Well, just so. even the body, just looking at it, I'm like, it looks... It's been cut up, too. A little bit <laughs> Dodge, but a little bit Jeep, but that's a big Jeep, and I, I don't know. <laughs> so back in that day, that would have been AMC. Okay. So AMC had a big part in that one. Okay. And then I can't remember when it switched over to Chrysler. I forget what, what year that was. They switched to Chrysler. I think that's 90s. So who did they switch from? There's AMC. There's another one in between there, I think. I don't remember. I think GM had their hand in it a little bit. Because some of them have GM consoles. Like, there's a GM... Or not console. Uh, oh, what am I thinking? Steering column. Oh, weird. So I've got a GM tilt column in it. I wonder if that's just a universal part that's not necessarily GM proprietary. It's stamped though. Yeah. So it, it's know. got the GM key and everything. What? Yeah. It's <laughs> so GM I, I don't kind know. Kind of a weird love child vehicle is this. Yeah. So it, it's AMC, but somewhere in the mix, somebody had another hand in. I can't remember what company it was. Um, comment below if you know who did the OG Wagoneer. Yeah. <laughs> um and then, the, so like the full-size Jeep trucks, mm-hmm. uh, that was another version of this. So when did that come out? Because the only knowledge I have of Jeep trucks, granted, I'm not a huge Jeep guy, so very limited knowledge here, but I remember people were taking the Wranglers to SEMA. They were hacking up the the back of the uh, cargo area, and they were putting truck beds on them. And that's how the Gladiator was born. That was addressing like all these SEMA mods, and they're like, oh, there's a market for this. Like, let's just make it OE. So you might be thinking of the Scrambler. Um, so the, the Wrangler, traditional round headlight Wrangler style. Yeah. The Scrambler is a CJ8. It's a basically a Jeep Wrangler with a longer tub, but the cab is not split. So the tub is just longer. It's a, it's a long Jeep. Huh. And so the Gladiator is kind of a spinoff from that with the cab being able to be split from the bed. Interesting. But what's funny too is they make bob kits now for the Jeep Gladiators, so you shorten the bed. What? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that makes sense for trails and stuff, because I'm yeah. sure, like, the approach angles are probably ass on the Gladiator. Yeah. Uh, so, approach angles aren't bad, but departure angles are horrid. Or, that's what I mean, departure. Yeah, because yeah. that's where the bed's at. And same with my Wagoneer. It's... Is it a problem? Do you ever scrape and smack it? Oh, man. I yeah. get hung up on... I have turtled on the, on the, uh, on the frame on the back. Really? Yeah. Just it, because of the wheelbase? The wheelbase is actually pretty good. 
I just have so it, much it, hanging off. Yeah, the body's hanging off so much. <laughs> like I drag the rear bumper everywhere I go. Do you have any plans to chop it? It's chopped as far as it can go. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Unless I start putting like an XO cage and start really working it, but I get away from the nostalgic Jeep at that point. Yeah, it'd be some weird kind of goofy. Yeah, it, it would be if I rolled it. Okay, let's start putting an XO cage and chopping it up more. Right. But it's chopped up now to the point like you still know what it is. Yeah. And it, it's got a nostalgic feel still. It's still Jeep. Yeah. So. But you don't feel like it's to the point where it's like, damn, I can't do half these trails because this shit just keeps getting stuck. <laughs> no, because really it's, I just got to watch like ravines. Really. Yeah. I mean, if it's I'm, real steep where you're coming up like that. Yeah. And, and like if I drop down in and have to come up, then I know my bumper's going to hit. So I got to come in at an angle. And so you can hit it sideways and typically you'll clear. Right. Okay. So I've, I just got to pick my lines differently than like a Jeep Wrangler, like a JK or something would. Right. <clears throat> so it, I mean, it comes with the, how do you feel like the overhang compares with like a pickup? You think it's pretty similar or not quite as bad? Um, it's probably pretty similar. I mean, I would, I would honestly compare it to like a blazer or. You compare it to a blazer, really? Because mm-hmm. I thought they were fairly capable and not a whole lot of like body hangups. It's about the same. Really? Yep. I actually have blazer, blazer leaf springs on the rear. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> so suburban front, blazer rear. Okay. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, that's what I would compare it to a blazer or like a mid 70s Bronco. Okay. So those are so cool. More we know how I feel about the Ram Charger in that <laughs> whole area. It's just, mm. man, it, it's cool. We went and did Nora, Nora 1000 in Mexico one year. Oh, really? And there was so many just nostalgic vintage trucks racing that race. Cause it's a vintage truck race. Okay. And it, I mean, there was some really cool trophy truck build oh, yeah. vintage trucks. And I mean, there's a couple square bodies in there and at the course they're all painted very pretty, like the nostalgic eighties and nineties, like yeah. what they should be. But yeah, that was a very cool race. Oh, I bet. <laughs> That'd be awesome to see, man. So what do you have planned for recoil coming up in the future? You did announce you've rescheduled the big event because that was supposed to be what last week. So it was supposed to be this past weekend, but the, the, Big event originally was already going to be in the springtime. Okay, so, so this is going to be like a trial run, special kind of thing. Yeah, so honestly, I was on one of the Disney Oklahoma Facebook groups, mm-hmm. and somebody's like, "Is there any events going on for Veterans Day? I think it'd be cool to put something on." I was like, "I'm like the organization to put something like that on." Right. Like, yeah. So I was like, "Shoot, I'll try it. See what happens." Yeah. And so I was just going to put on a little geocache race. Little did I know, insurance says geocaching is high risk. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yes. That's. I wonder why. Did they explain that at all? Yeah, so apparently, since you're getting out of the vehicle, there's more trip hazards, and you're more than likely going to fall and break your arm or something like that, so there's more expenses in that. So, quick, quick side story. I can kind of understand that. My girlfriend and I went to a wedding. Mm-hmm. She was in heels. She got out of my truck and she, I don't know if her heel got stuck on my running board or if she slipped on the running board, but she essentially fell from the top entryway of the door to the pavement on her knee and like just destroyed her knee Mm. and like was not good for probably about a month. (laughs) Yikes. So like (laughs) I can, as much as I hate insurance, I can kind of get it. Yeah, I mean, for stuff like that, but then you put it on a mass scale, it's like, okay, I, I could kind of see that. Yeah. So, um, event insurance, like, basically doubled. Oh. Yeah. So, so what was your premium for that? Was it like two grand? Or? It was two grand for one day. Oh, my God. <laughs> it was supposed to be like a three-day event? Well, so I was, it was going to be three days, but it's more of like the main event's going to be one day. One day was the race. Yes. One okay. day is the race. The rest of it, hang out wheel all you want. Like, I don't have any say so in what you're doing as far as that goes yeah like i just want the one day to sanction this event right so that's all i was going to do there um but now that i know that i can kind of approach that angle a little bit differently yeah so i i took it as a learning curve because had i not known that the upcoming event i would have done the same thing and then would have like 
you know, kicked me in the butt right there too. Yeah. So it, it, you know, it paid off. Right. Yeah. So, it's good that you could at least walk away from that with some knowledge exactly. and better preparation. Yep. Um, so just for everyone that doesn't know, um, he was planning to put on this veterans day geocache race. It, we, we weren't able to totally complete that and finalize plans because, um, we didn't have sponsors together, just everything. It, it was more than what we thought it was going to be to put everything together and make it happen. I think it was too short notice. That <clears throat> is part I mean, of it. I had, I had just a lot of resources, plan. not a lot of time. Yes. And neither of us can, you know, just put up funds like that at a moment's right. notice with no return. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and I had my price point of entry fee, um, a little low as well. I think. What was it? I didn't even know what it was. It was, Twenty dollars per driver, mm -hmm. co-driver or your your navigator was fifteen. Okay. So and you could do it as a, a single, you know, you're driving and navigating, or have a navigator with you, so okay. a team race. And by the time if I got fifty participants, it was going to be like a thousand bucks. Okay. With, with driver co-driver, it's like eh, yeah, that offsets the cost a little bit, but that's half of insurance. What right. About first, second, third place prizes and yeah. you know, all the other stuff. Like it, it takes a lot of partnership and, um, shout out to Mike with airlift for coming through on that. Yes, absolutely. Mike is the, he's is saving the grace there. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, just to plug the event in April. Yes. So we're looking at, I think mid April, um, location still did be to be determined. Disney's um, probably a safe bet. So the events that I want to do, or host during this big event, I don't think Disney is capable of it. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. Um, because being an off rodeo, there's going to be some barrel racing. Okay. Um, whether <laughs> that's cool. full size and side by side, whatever the case may be, we're going to do a spin off of some barrel racing. That would be sick. Um, and then I will do a timed obstacle course. Okay. Um, and maybe some drag racing or something. But I oh man, I want to, and I want a place for all the vendors to set up. You know, if you're there, you can just spectating. You can go visit all the vendors and whatnot and check out what cool products oh, they yeah. have. Oh, yeah, and if and, you have those events spread out through the day, dude, that's mm -hmm. like... Well, if I did a weekend deal, which yeah. is the plan, I want to do probably a two- to three-day event. That'd be amazing. And I can have an overlanding competition, so I get the overlanding crowd. Right. Um, let them come out, set up all their tents and that sort of thing. We have a competition. The treasure hunt... Um, okay. I can have going all weekend, um, and just like it, instead of being time, it's like the first three people back with whatever I put out, uh, wins. And that can be announced like at the end of the event. Okay. Um, and then, you know, the barrel racing and then maybe some short course, obstacle course stuff, rock garden, stuff like that. So we're looking at a few different venues. Um, I've gotten a couple people reached out and want to help um but i don't know to what extent so we're still looking for we're gonna options. need a lot of hands on deck for an event like that yes yes yeah. so and, and that's a big one too is volunteers like it was with putting on the geocache race i had a lot of people want to run it like participate nobody wanted to volunteer <laughs> right yeah so it was like okay i mean i get you guys want to run it but i need some help <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know with an event that big though i think that also brings in the opportunity for way bigger sponsorships mm -hmm. um you know people wanting to be involved in what you're doing so that that has the potential to really be something and, and to me it, it helps the parts as well i want to do this event every year annually but mm -hmm. i want it to be at a different park every year yeah so this year it's going to be more of an experiment to see what what it's going to look like mm -hmm. and then i can just dial it in every year after right you know make it bigger make it better whatever the case may be um if i need to dial it back then i can you know whatever but um this is really a test fire and see what happens yeah so uh, but yeah I'll, I'll probably end up with an event this big i will up the registration and all that because i mean if i if i can't go into it where i can get recoil um an outreach for recoil and financially stable, then I can't really put on events like that. Cause at right. that point it's just costing me. Yeah. 
So, and, and a nonprofit, we don't generate revenue. Yeah. <laughs> that is our revenue. <laughs> it's not like a smaller event, like what you originally had planned where it's like, okay, if you got to eat some of it, fine. Right. This is kind of like an all or nothing deal where it's like, mm-hmm. if you come up short, the margin's still going to be massive. Right. Right. You know, cause that's going to be a big undertaking. And I also want it to be a spot where veterans, I want two trips planned out for next year, big trips, mm-hmm. um, to either Colorado or Moab, probably both. Um, and be able to sign up veterans at that event for those trips. Oh yeah. Um, the the guesstimated cost is about ten grand per trip. Okay. Is what it's going to cost me. So if I can get the following with this event and get this to kind of kick off the brand, mm-hmm. then I'm hoping that will be able to launch those two those two trips and really take things off from there. Yeah. So that's my ultimate goal for the event. Okay. That would so. be super cool. Do you plan on doing anything kind of small scale locally for people who can't commit to big trips like that? So we're working on a few things actually. Okay. Um, there's a group of us that get together like during the week and just hang out. Um, Heath Woods, he's a good friend of mine. He's a veteran as well. He has the veteran build, uh, which is a Brock buggy that he's building, but I'll let him – when it's time, let him diversion and all the details. Okay. Um, but we go and hang out like once or twice a week just to break up the mundaneness of life and work. And, you know, I don't work to come home and just be at home. Right. Kind of thing. Yeah. Um, we're also looking at a couple of, um, areas locally that we can do some overlanding trips okay. or camping. That it's like, it's a Friday night. It's been a shit week. Let's just get out. And it's only 20 minutes away. Yeah. So we can get, you know, 10, 15 people out. Then we can make something happen there. So there's there's a couple places nearby that we're looking at. Um, I can't really go into details about them yet. Okay. Because there's a lot of stuff in the works. Yeah. But there's a group of us that will be putting together a small group of people, select invite only kind of thing. Okay. To make some stuff happen. Um. I just can't go into details about it. Okay. So that's fair. Uh, but it, I mean, if you're local, feel free to get a hold of me just on Facebook or like really anywhere. Um, I don't care if you text my phone at two o'clock in the morning, you need some help, like get a hold of me um, or, or call me, whatever. And we will set up like a weekend, like, hey, we're, you know, I can't do anything for you tonight, but let's go out this weekend, go hit some trails. Yeah. I mean, even if you're just going out on a Saturday afternoon, take the TJ out for two hours. You exactly. Know? That can that can make the biggest difference to somebody. Mm-hmm. Um, my friend Ryan Johnson, he was Army Guard as well, and there was I was going through something a couple of years ago where just everything was shit, and I was just at a weird spot. And he was like, "Man, come up with me." So he did recoil outdoor up in mm-hmm. the sky because <laughs> yep, <laughs> he's yep. a private pilot. So he's like, yep. "Man, I'm just like taking this out um, after some maintenance was done." So he's like, "Just come up with me." He's like, I "Might fall out of the sky." But, you know, <laughs> we'll have fun doing it. <laughs> yeah, it's either going to be a good time or you don't have to pay bills anymore. So exactly. Win-win. It's suddenly not your problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I think stuff like that and having a resource like that is just, is really important. And that's what I've done on the on the back end of these things. Like for me, I was getting in the waggy when I got home, going out, hitting trails, having some fun, building it. Just enjoying the off road. I got me a side by side. And so I started getting some buddies into it and seeing guys that were like kind of down themselves, looking for that way to reintegrate into society. Mm-hmm. And then they get into off road and they're like, holy cow, this, yeah. this is what we do. Right. <laughs> it's like, yeah. I actually took a good friend of mine, uh, Joseph Tran. He He's an Asian guy. And I say this because we were out at crossbar during a rock bouncer race. Okay. He had never been off road. Didn't know it existed. Okay. His off road was going down dirt roads. Yeah. So I get him out there and I'm helping work the race. I have him there with me and we're standing there as this 800,000 horsepower rock bouncers going up rock face. He goes, this white people shit's fun. <laughs> <laughs> and two weeks later goes out and buys a razor. Yeah. And now he's like gung ho to go do everything we want to do and go have fun and enjoy life. He goes, dude, this brought me so much more peace. And like, it's, it's so fun. He's like, I, otherwise I'll be at home watching movies or, you know, doing nothing. Right. Yeah. It's great because like, aside from obviously the initial buying cost, 
you know, let's, hypothetically, let's say you just have some money laying around. You go buy a side by side. Upkeep is really cheap. Mm-hmm. Fuel is really cheap. And that's hours and hours of fun on the weekend for you to yeah. connect with people, go out and do stuff. You know, it's like, I mean, all honesty, like I live in the city and going to Crossbar. Um, and for those that don't know, Crossbar is an off road park in Davis, Oklahoma, 6,500 acres of trails. <clears throat> it would cost me probably when fuel got expensive, 150 bucks a weekend. Yeah. Back when it wasn't super expensive, it was like, all right, let's fill a truck up for 50 bucks, go to Crossbar and back. You know, yeah, and it's a weekend trip. There's camping, there's wheeling. Dude, this is like do. an hour south. Yeah, yeah, it's like an hour south. Exit fifty five on I thirty five, and Turner Falls backs up to uh, Crossbar, so it's cool to hit the oh, trails yeah. and you get your ticket down there at Crossbar, your wristband, mm-hmm. and go hit Turner Falls. Yeah, you know, you can access it from the trails. They have really nice cabins over there too. They do. I want to stay in one of those real bad. <laughs> and they're also like building some more and putting a lot more money into it. Okay. So <laughs> there's some works going on over there too. Sweet. Um, but, for Crossbar, how built out of a rig do you have to have to tackle that? Is that pretty advanced or? 85% of the trails you can do with the stock Jeep. Like What about a stock truck? You could get to the spots to see the carnage. Okay, but you probably can't make it through the trails? No. Oh. Like, I wouldn't take your truck through the trails. No? No, I would take it to Rock Face. You'd be going slow all the way to Rock Face, but you'll get there. Okay. And Rock Face is like the main hub of where people hang out and people do dumb stuff and rollovers happen. And Ooh. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's more of a flop and kind of go down, slides down some rocks. But yeah, right. I mean, it's, you can get to the main area. So, uh, we've taken numerous trucks out there, hauled bands out there to rock face for live concerts stuff. So that's awesome. Yeah. It, it, I mean, you can get to most of the stuff there. Um, now if you really want to hit like technical stuff, a Rubicon on like 35s will do more stuff out there. At a rock face? Um, at crossbar. Oh, crossbar. Okay. Yep. So, um, <clears throat> And then from there, you've got the really technical stuff, which is like buggy line stuff for really built Jeeps. So um, your forerunner would make it out there anywhere kind of thing. Okay. So, um, you know, it's a good time out there. Okay. I definitely want to get out more because it's like I haven't really, you know, since getting my truck, I haven't taken it out and really gone and done anything. I haven't seen these venues that you're talking about. And that's something that I really want to experience because I'm not going to put myself out there and say that I'm a part of the culture, but you know, it's something that I want to learn more about and I want to get involved in. Cause I think it, it's fun. You know, there's, I think it's a different form of motorsport. That's, I don't know how to phrase when you're young and you're in your 20s, you want to go fast. Mm-hmm. You want to roll race on the turnpike at 3 a.m. And nothing good comes of that. Best case scenario, you are super tired the next day and you beat on your car. Worst case scenario, you go to jail, you die, your car gets wrecked. Like just, you know, and then drag racing is cool. It's fun. I love watching it. But it's like, all right, cool. You drove it for 10 seconds. Right. Neat might cost you a $20,000 engine doing that. And it's just like autocross, you have to tow the car all the way out to a racetrack. And then that is probably the most mechanically demanding motorsport there is. Mm -hmm. Cause you're just, you know, banging limiter and you're up there for the entire time you're making these laps and it's getting so hot and you're, and it's not just your engine, it's your brakes, your suspension, everything gets trashed. Right. So that just like beats the hell out of your car. So this is cool because it's, Way more leisurely. It's, I, it's technical. I mean, yeah, but you're like looking at your door trying to figure out, you know, what route do I need to take? Oh, am I right. going to clear this? It's not like. You really got to know what your, your vehicle is doing. Yeah. Like under you. Like, because a lot of people, I feel like car control is more of, you know, where the body's at. Yeah. How much flex the suspension's going to have, which on road cars is not much. Right. But you add in like, I'm at, I just picked up 14 inches of travel with those coilovers I got. That's a that's a lot. lot. That is an insane <laughs> amount. I mean, extended is 36 inches. That's wild. So, I mean, you go... That's from extension to compression? Extension to compression, um, 
Yeah, so it full extension is forty or thirty six inches. Three feet of travel. Yeah, and and then not three feet of travel, but is it actually it, three feet of travel? No, full travel is fourteen inches. Four, okay. So, but when I measured them, it like full extension, like if if the axle stuffed in one corner and drooped in the other, mm -hmm. it was at thirty six inches. That's insane. Yeah. So to know like what the vehicle is going to do at that point, and then yeah. knowing like four link and and um your your uh leaf springs like how those are gonna react you gotta know all your right angles and making sure everything your geometry your suspension's right like, right but it's more about going out and just making it work yeah it's not trial by error i don't know what i'm doing with my waggy i'll be honest i have no idea <laughs> well you spend I, all your time hacking it up and not driving it yep <laughs> <laughs> well because i hacked it up drove it and didn't like it so now i'm changing it right <laughs> But, it, I mean, it's a lot of learning what stuff is doing. I wing it most of the time. And, like, I have a general idea. I started wheeling, oh, when I was, I don't even remember when I started. It's, I was way young. And my d dad had Jeeps. My grandpa had Jeeps. In fact, I have a blue XJ in my driveway right now that was my grandpa's. My dad bought it from him, put a lift on it. Rip it? No, the. Different uh, one. Yeah. So the, the TJ is the Wrangler. The XJ is the Jeep Cherokee. Oh, okay. So I've got that one there actually fixing it because I messed it up um, on a wheeling trip recently. Whoops. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but it's cool to know that like I'm third generation and I'm in that Jeep. Yeah. So it, it there's a lot of wheeling that's came from that. But we also, I didn't, I was never into the big time wheeling. If you had 37s, you were doing some big stuff right now 37s are like the new 35s right 35s the new 33s yeah so and we had 32s on it and we were going most places yeah you know it, it was a little bit of a struggle sometimes but like if you knew your lines knew what you're doing you could get most places mm -hmm. so that's where it taught me a, a lot of wheeling was that and so now with the 37s and now i've got 40s on the tj it's Ooh. like oh this is cush yeah <laughs> makes it real easy yeah <laughs> So you don't have to pick the line as much, but if you pick the wrong line, you're and you're in the wrong spot right. completely. <laughs> yeah. So it's not just a little mistake; it's a big one, for sure. But yeah, so I mean, there's a lot of wheeling to be had in Oklahoma that a lot of people aren't even aware of. Well, I mean, even to me, so like somebody who's not really plugged into the community, it just seems so flat. And looking around, like, the land's private, closed off. Like, it just doesn't seem like there's anywhere to do this stuff without knowing you and you telling me these things. Like, I would have said, no, man, you probably have to go to Texas or something for that. Right. Somewhere out of state. That, yeah. Yeah. No, Oklahoma's got a lot. And, I mean, and that's right there for one of the things that I want to provide with recoil. Yeah. It's like, guys like you that wouldn't know where to look. Yeah. Even it, if you could just, like, start that fire in somebody. Exactly. Like, let's say they're financially well off and they just don't know what to do with themselves. Mm -hmm. This could be a great thing to put yourself into. Yeah. And you can do it super cheap. You don't have to have what I have. You don't have to have the TJ or the waggy. You can go like, if you got a forerunner, you've got a little Tacoma, like right. throw a tent in the bed. Oh, I say money know? because like, even if you get a shit box, it's going to cost five, 10 grand to go out and do something, you know? I mean, it depends what wheeling you want to do. If you want to go bash it, find you a thousand dollar Jeep Cherokee and just full send it. <laughs> oh man, yeah, I you mean, know, you're not wrong. Like, there's Shitbox Nation on Facebook for a reason, <laughs> and wrong. it's mainly dedicated to XJs. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, there's ways of getting into it super, super cheap. Okay. But it's what kind of wheeling do you want to do? Yeah. Do you have a lead foot? Just want to go fast everywhere? You don't care. Uh, what lines you pick, you just want to make it to the top. Maybe you have a broken axle at the top, or do you want to <laughs> pick and choose your lines and, you know, make it over with ease, and then you come out and wheel another weekend? Yeah. You know, so, like, I, I have my left foot sometimes. I've went up rock face just being stupid one day. It's like, I'm just going to mat it to the floor and see what it does. Fastest I've ever made it to the top. Wow. And in rock face, like, I'm not bragging about it because it, it, crossbar is something that once you learn crossbar, you're like, Okay, I don't want to break here. Right. It's not worth breaking at. Yeah. But it's worth experiencing it. Right. So, so you got to kind of play it safe there a little bit. Yeah. Like, and I say play it safe, like, there's enough stupid to be had if you're being stupid. Right. But if you're just not being stupid and you're just, like, doing your thing, like, you're, you're safe. 
Right. You know, there's lines that you like, yeah, no, I, I don't need to do that. And you're going to see some general Polaris general come back behind you and they're going to do that line. Like, Oh, I can do that. Dude, I almost bought one of those. This looks so sick. <laughs> it's like they're a, not bad. Like a lot like of people a, get them golf cart on steroids is awesome yeah and you can put ac in them and heat oh man yeah full enclosure what do you you get like one of those uh retro like hvac no they make ac kits for them oh of course they do <laughs> players <laughs> yeah it's for everything <laughs> yes want to put a boost motor in it and here's a swap kit yep yep but yeah no i mean it just depends on what your budget really is on how you want to get into it like my wheeling style I love the bouncer stuff. Don't get me wrong. Like the rock bouncer, a thousand horsepower, pin it to the floor, you know, Tim Cameron type stuff. Yeah. But I also like just going and enjoying scenery. So the waggy is a go anywhere kind of rig. Yeah. That's kind of what I want. Yeah. I, I don't know? need a rock bouncer. Right. That's what the TJ is for. I can throw somebody in it that may not know wheeling. And if they roll it, well, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay whatever it's pretty idiot proof yeah so yeah. It, it, i can bounce it off of a tree and not care yeah i've got three prerequisites when i man up and spend the money to build something yeah it's gotta look interesting i want another boring jeep build mm -hmm. um like everybody just goes out and gets the new jeep and puts 37s on it and it's like oh wow i've never seen that before i've got a jeep i can yeah. go off road yeah <laughs> so i want a unique chassis it doesn't have to be anything crazy, but, you know, I want it to be kind of cool conversation piece. Like we talked about, like a G-Wagon would be amazing. If I can get an old clapped out one, that's mm -hmm. something that cost me a billion dollars. The Ram charger, um, you know, just something like that. My second thing is accessibility. It doesn't need to have the best performance, but just like how you talked about the Waggy, I want to be able to go places. I don't want to have this dedicated built rig and be like, oh shit, I can't run that trail or oh shit, I can't do this or that after investing in a dedicated build for that. Like I want it to be able to perform. Yeah. And three, it's got to make some sick turbo sounds. <laughs> turbo sounds are mandatory. <laughs> We're talking like just mesh turbo guard and hood exit yep, diesel, yep. whether it's M57, OM606, 6BT, I don't care. As long as it makes a turbo sound. <laughs> it's It's got to eat fryer grease and blow smoke. Yep, yep. So that's what was cool about mine is, so I started planning this build on deployment. Actually, it was before deployment. I had picked up a buddy of mine in uh, Tulsa, had a naturally aspirated OM606. Oh, what? And I was like, I'll buy that. He wanted like, I don't remember, it was 1200 bucks or something like that. I was like, hey, while well, I'm overseas, just go through it. I'll pay you to do it, but go through it, refresh it up, and I'm going to stick a turbo on it. He goes, okay. You know, and the only difference I think was the rods on those probably so, a little weaker yeah uh <clears throat> the turbo engines have i think forged internals i could be wrong on that uh i know they're stronger uh so it's like hey let's just go through it and i had a yj at the time mm -hmm. square headlight wrangler and so i was going to put that engine in that oh so i started put getting an excel spreadsheet overseas you have nothing to do oh yeah you plan everything oh man i had excel spreadsheets for everything oh yeah same and I had the links, the notes, everything about it. Yep. And I was dead set on it. I was like, you know what? I'm going to sell the Jeep, but I'm going to keep the motor. Okay. So I sold the Jeep. I think it was like 3500 bucks. It was cheap because it was pretty clapped out. Yeah. Because w when I started doing the build out, it started snowballing. I was like, to put the engine in, I've got to remove the axle. Well, if I take the axle out, I might as well put a different one back in. Oh, yeah. So let's go one ton. <laughs> okay, so now I got to put another axle in. Now what suspension do I need? And so it just snowballed to like a $12,000 build without even looking at the nickel and dime stuff. Yeah. So I was like, all right, screw it. I'll keep the motor, but I'll sell the Jeep. I'll, I had to buy me a truck and house. It was more about paying off debt and making stuff happen. Right. So then I got home and, and my ultimate goal when I still built that out was like I was, I'd never stopped thinking about it. I, I still wanted – really deployment gave me a sense of uh, appreciation for the small things. Mm -hmm. And so when I was over there, it's like I always wanted to go out in the middle of nowhere. Like my, my biggest thing is like I needed space away from people yeah. and things. Um, there was generators going on constantly. You were, I was seeing the same people, same thing, 13 months, day in, day out. Yep. And so my thing was like I needed a break. And so I was like imagining these breaks in my head. Like you're, you're there for so long. You feel like you're a prisoner to what you're doing. And so you just dream about what you could be doing. Right. And so I built up this whole thing in my head of what I wanted. And 
the OM606 will run off of vegetable oil, mm -hmm. recycled oil, as long as you strain it and get you a fuel heater, stuff mm -hmm. like that. So I started looking like a centrifuge and making a homemade centrifuge to make all my own oil uh, reusable and whatnot. Um, and my goal was to be able to go off grid for up to a month at a time in the Waggy. Just, I don't need anybody there. I just want to be off grid for a month right. by myself and be completely self-sufficient. And so uh, I built all that up in my head and planned it all out. So when I got home, um, I had the motorcycle, I had the boat, sold them both, um, and got the Waggy. And it was like, all right, it, it was LS swapped with the four speed. And it was great, but it wasn't the 606. It wasn't the Mercedes diesel. Right. So I was like, screw it. I'm putting a diesel in it. I've never done it. I'm going to do it now. Yeah. <laughs> so I just took the motor out, sold the, like, I sold the LS swap as a kit, turnkey kit from radiator to gas tank. Here you go. This will fit a full size Jeep. Mm -hmm. And somebody bought it up, uh, which was kind of cool. That sparked another friendship up and he he wheels a lot so i go wheeling with him he comes out to events too. oh he's local he's out in elk city okay um so like an hour or so west uh yeah about an hour and a half west uh but he's got some really cool stuff too okay um smoking gun fabrication is okay. he's got a shop there and he builds like the uh oh what do you call them like the earth roamers you seen those uh -uh. it's like an f550 chassis with super singles and a big old camper on it and everything what it's massive that sounds nuts it, that's it like is. a consumer grade monster truck it's a house that's a monster truck <laughs> that's incredible but he builds similar stuff to that like he's into the big stuff because the 550 chassis is like a baby semi right like yeah, that's what it goes it's a from... cabin chassis is it yeah because well what are the like goofy looking tow truck things are those the 650s yeah i think those are 650s okay so this is still, you still have the cab of like an F-250 or 350. Oh, okay. Gotcha, gotcha. But you have a big old camper on the back. Right. With super single monster, like 43 inch tires. Yeah. And that's sick because like when you get into that chassis code of like the 550 or whatever, they build the axles and the trans and everything mm -hmm. to handle like a ridiculous payload and towing capacity. Yeah. So it's like it's set up for it. Right. But I mean, those things are, I think they're around $600,000 to buy one. Yeah. I, and I could be wrong on that, but. Oh, uh, his finished product? No, not his. The actual Earth Roamer. I forget who builds those out as Earth Roamers. But he has a camper right now that he built. It's a international, I think it's like a 4100 or something like that. It's an old fire truck. Oh. Uh, like quad cab fire truck. And yeah. he took the bed off of it, put a flat bed on it, used it as like a crawler hauler, put his Jeep on the back, and then he got rid of that converted it to four-wheel drive what? and put like big axle tech axles under it and everything and uh, uh the old five-ton axles yeah that's what he has under it and then he put a camper on it that's crazy and it's all decked out inside full shower everything <laughs> it's a house on wheels that's so cool and then the trailer he did the same axles so he pulls his crawler behind that oh wow so but, it's like some kind of weird off-road diy toy hauler type deal yeah but he can go all over with it. Like, he's taking it to California. Like, what are they Colorado. calling Toter homes? Yeah, that's essentially what it is. Just four-wheel drive and badass. That's insane. <laughs> it's an overlanding Toter home. Yeah, it, it's honestly like the overlander's dream build. That's so cool. But um, he's selling that right now for, like, 150K. Oh, is that all? Yeah. It's like, I mean, if me you look house. to do it yourself or hire a company to do it, it would probably cost you three times that. Yeah. So, but he, that's what he does full-time, though, is he builds that kind of stuff. That's and then. Cool. All the fire uh, fire trucks out there, the water trucks, whatnot, he'll get old Hemets and put the water tanks on them. Um, all the, uh, the freaking tow truck stuff that's on the Hemets, he'll take all that stuff off and swap stuff around. Like, he's into the big stuff. That's cool. But he's, he's a really good friend of mine now, and we go out wheeling all over the place. Okay. So. It'll be the, fun to join you guys if my yeah. stock little GMC can hang oh we'll get it somewhere <laughs> <laughs> back to the dealership <laughs> i don't know what happened here <laughs> yeah i don't know how it broke both front axles yeah. front half shafts on but yeah so that's the community that that you build in the off-road industry is insane yeah it sounds like it so it it 
that's what's brought me some joy is just meeting people along the way and just making the relationships, building the relationships and everything. So. Are you familiar with uh, drag and drive events? Yeah. So it sounds like a lot of that. You ever heard of the ultimate adventure? No, I have not. So it's the drag and drive version of the off-road industry. Okay. They go to like numerous parks around the U S every year and you literally build like the waggy. And take it off-road or an extreme buggy of some sort. So is it all done on one vehicle, no towing? You have to drive your off-road rig to these locations? Wheel it and drive it to the next location. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So, so it's you, like you have to complete your trail. You get your check for the day or whatever, mm-hmm. like you, your completion. Yep. You and, camp by on the trail or wherever you're at, you camp out. Oh, dude, that sounds and nuts. And keep going. Oh, man. It's, it's like the OG of wheeling. That's um, crazy. So where does that where does that span? Like, what parks do you hit? It's a different park every single year. Oh, okay. And they like, I think they do like six parks every every time or something like that. Does it usually span like half the U.S. or is it just like Pacific Northwest, South? It's really all over. So like when they did it in twenty, yeah, it's twenty one. We guided them out at Crossbar. Okay. And they came from like, there was a park out east. I forget what exact park it was. And some of them are also like private land that is not wheeling accessible, but somebody has wheeled there previously. So they get a hold of the owner and it's like, hey, can we come out and shoot this TV show and wheel <laughs> a little bit? You know, that's cool. So, but you get a lot of the, the famous people out there that are in the off road industry. So, like Ian Johnson, he's a big one, like Extreme 4x4 when I was a kid. I watch that every Saturday. Okay. And he, he's the type that with, uh, well, you know, Jesse Combs. I think so. You don't know Jesse Combs? I, <laughs> I don't know. No, so, so sure. Jesse Combs was very iconic and uh, passed away not long ago. Oh. Um, she, I think she set the land speed record and uh, oh. ended up passing away from the wreck that happened there. But oh. Ann Johnson like back in the day had a TV show with her and they built Jeeps and off-road stuff. And so it was really cool watching him build all stuff. It was like, he's the chip foose of the off-road industry. Okay. Um, I've done work for chip foose. Oh snap. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I really admire his work and what he was doing. So, uh, but yeah, he would come out there dirt head every day. Um, bunch of off-road designs. It's a big, um, in the off-road industry, they're a big vendor. Um, Skyjacker suspension. Yep, I know them. The owners would they do that event? Okay. Um, there's a few others, but yeah, it, it's a big one. It's fun, like drag and drive. I would love to do a drag and drive event for off road. Yeah. It's not so much ultimate adventure because ultimate adventure is so big. It'd be cool if we could do one, okay. like even just locally. Like if there mm-hmm. were three or four spots in Oklahoma and we could do it over a weekend, like a small. Like, yep. do you know Jared Holt? Yeah, yeah. Cruise so, in Oklahoma. Yes. So Jared is doing King of the Open Road, which is a really small. Um, well, I say really small. It's a very condensed drag and drive event. Mm-hmm. So there are so many people out there who can't take a whole week off work to spend a week's worth of hotels and fuel and car parts and taking on a lot of these drag and drive events, which like industry standard is about a week long. Right. That's a huge undertaking. Yes. So for normal people like you and I, he's made a very condensed, easily digestible version where it's only like three days. Right. And instead of going 1,300 miles, you're going 400 miles. And it's just, it's less stressful. I feel like it's a lot more digestible for most people. So if, you know, you could come up with something like that for It'd also be easy if you had the backup for it as far as like the, the scene. Yeah. There's an off-road scene in Oklahoma. 90% of the OG people in the off-road scene are older now it's like all right it's time to retire oh, or yeah. you know certain wheeling trips yeah so now guys like us coming in younger is like all right we gotta keep the scene going you know right. um <clears throat> there's a lot of trails around oklahoma that people don't even know about i've got onyx off-road and i've mapped out several in oklahoma the there's an oklahoma circumnavigational trail that mm-hmm. goes like literally the border of oklahoma all the way oh, around crazy. it crazy uh, there's the Oklahoma Adventure Trail okay. with points of interest all the way around Oklahoma, literally circles Oklahoma. What's that trail like? 
it's different everywhere you go. Oh, really? But okay. I mean, it's not like hardcore stuff. It's more of like dirt road. Go up and check out. There's a. So it's very entry level friendly. Oh yeah. Okay. Very, very much so. So you have points of interest to go see stuff like Jesse think, James rock stuff over there. That how cool would that be? Just to bring awareness to recoil. If we could like set up a cruise that mm-hmm. hit trails like that. So it's like you don't need a lift. You don't need forties. You don't need you know a winch. Mm-hmm. You know you could just take your daily out. You know people right. like me who don't who haven't yet jumped into that like dedicated rig mm-hmm. where it's just like this is my daily. I want to go do something now. Right. So like, like sh- Sugar Creek Loop would be a good one. Where's that at? That's like south. These freaking airplanes, man. I, Sundance is like right there and it's the worst oh, really? thing. Yeah. I hate it. Um, Southwest Oklahoma. Like take 152 out west and okay. you're pretty much at Sugar Creek area. Okay. And you just look it up on the map. And there's a big loop right there you can do. Sugar Creek. So if I put that in the Google Maps right now. It may not pull up on Google Maps. I wonder if I can type in. Sugar Creek. So I can barely see that, but that's all of Oklahoma stuff. Oh, wow. <laughs> and if I zoom in. So like all the trails and stuff you mapped out? That's Goat Trail just in northeast Oklahoma. What the hell? And that is. What are those, those little gray tabs? Points of interest. Oh, my gosh. So if I can find. Um. A distance here. That's like a nine day trail. And it's all dirt road. You don't touch pavement. That's nuts. So there, there's stuff like that in Oklahoma. I just got to like make it worth doing yeah. and making sure the backing's there to make it happen. Right. So I, I don't want to go put this on and be like, yeah, let's go. And then two people show up. Right. You know, I want to build like 10, 15 show up and we go have some fun, go and find a random spot to camp out at, whatever. Right. But and we we do that um, on KLRs quite a bit. Uh, we'll enduro bikes. Yeah. There's like six or seven of us that have them. And we just go like find all these random trails and you, That's know, awesome. you can put hard bags on them, whatever. So <laughs> That's cool. But yeah, there's a lot of trails just in Oklahoma that no, nobody knows about. Yeah, I so, believe it. Uh, Southeast Oklahoma is beautiful. Oh, I bet. Yeah, that's uh, like Broken Bow ish and Tallahena. Yeah, Washtenaw National Forest area. Yeah, so I was actually down there probably about a month ago mm-hmm. trying to get all the, the color change and everything for the season. Oh, man. The scenic byway. That's nuts. Tallahena Byway? Yeah. Man. So we actually stay at Billy Creek, which is just a few miles south of there. You actually, like, almost three quarters of the way up Tallahena Byway, mm-hmm. you jump off, off on a dirt road and go down the mountain. Okay. And there's some cabins down there in the woods that we stay at. Okay. I sit in Smithville. Okay. Heck yeah. yeah. We stayed at Billy Creek. And then there's like three sticks that's up there. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's a good pullover lookout point. And then if you continue on that trail, I forget how many miles it is. I think it's like six or seven miles. There's an old abandoned fire tower there. Oh. Um, so that's cool to go check out. But it's a lot of like, we did a weekend trip there, me and a buddy of mine and his wife. We rented a cabin and just went up to the mountains and went wheeling and... I mean, we made a solid weekend out of it, and we didn't see a quarter of what's up there. Oh, yeah. So there's the Kaimichis and all sorts of stuff up there. The Kaimichi. Why does it sound familiar? It's near Clayton. And Clayton's another big wheeling park, but it's like the rocks there, I've heard, are like the size of Volkswagen Beetles. Oh, wow. So, <laughs> so you need like a proper crawler for that. Yeah. Like the Waggy would not go out there. The TJ would go out there. The Waggy won't. Yeah. That makes sense. But, yeah, it's... So there's that park. Um, really, like the border from Arkansas to Oklahoma, and even like clear across the border, there's several trails too. And you can like in the weekend cross the border all day long. You won't even know it. Yeah. So it uh, blends. on trails, yeah. Right. And so it, but yeah, it's it's a gorgeous scenery up there and great place to ride. Hell yeah. So so is there anything that you want to tell people on YouTube or Spotify? Before we wrap this up, anything like how can they help recoil? What do you need right now? Really, what I need right now is partnerships. Um, financially, it's a big, um, big deal out of my own pocket right. at the moment. And so that's really what we're looking for. Our, our biggest thing we're pushing for is financially. Right. Um, that will launch so much more social media, um, a lot more 
works into revenue streams mm -hmm. so that we can continue to do this. Um, I can't pour in, pour myself into it enough without it. Yeah. Um, so everything right now has been out of my pocket and I'm really limited because I still got my own bills to pay. Yeah. So funding another business from your main source of income is not doable. <laughs> yeah. That's rich people stuff, man. That's not us. Yeah. That's, that's regular people we can't do that no so that's our big push um and then when it comes to events just reach out we'll have on our web page as soon as it gets released we'll have links where you can go in and volunteer and um see what our current needs are and just kind of go from there right so yeah find us on facebook we've got a page recoil outdoor we also have a group uh join both of them and uh we'll post updates in there and see what we're doing so any businesses watching he is a registered 501c any donations, anything put towards it is tax deductible. Uh, great marketing opportunities ahead. Maybe a livery for the Jeep or the Waggy or something, maybe. I'm working on it. I'm working on it with Evan. Oh, yeah. Okay. Sick. Yep. So I'm going to have Evan do some livery stuff for the Jeep. Probably both of them. Um, but so my, my ultimate goal with recoil as far as vehicles go, I want to have 10 vehicles that I can throw guys in. Mm -hmm. Um whether that's support or wheeling and every one of them, I will have a livery of some sort on. So, um, that's my end goal long-term is yeah. I will have a fleet. Uh, right now I just have two, but we're getting there. And for any sponsors who might be interested, um, as soon as we get the ball rolling and get some events and trips lined up, I plan on covering everything as much as I can for photo and video to do my part to help chance out, um so the more you can contribute to the cause the more events and things that we could do the more coverage i can do to not only get you sponsorship for events but youtube social media things like that as well lots of lots of branding and marketing opportunities to be had there is i've reached out to a few um i'm waiting to hear back we have a big race going on right now baja 1000 okay so after Baja settles down, I think I might get some answers back. But Once everybody gets back in their offices. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> so, but yeah, just reach out to me. Like like you said, everything's tax deductible. I can provide receipts, uh, the whole nine. Uh, we, are also, we are also looking for board members. If anybody's interested in being a on the board, you know, push us in the right direction and whatnot. I've got two chairs open. So Sweet. We're just out here trying to have some fun and help the community and you know do my part yeah absolutely yeah. well thanks for coming out to my backyard yep yep um it's fun yeah absolutely i'm gonna start doing this for some of my guests this isn't gonna be like the normal thing but um for people like chance who can't you know during normal business hours meet me downtown at the office that i use um i'm gonna start offering this for some some few people who just cannot make the schedule work so, uh, yeah, you'll probably see some more of this. I have another guest lined up for 9 a.m. tomorrow. Heck, yeah. So, <laughs> the grind doesn't stop. No, no, sir, it does not. <laughs> so thanks for coming out here. I appreciate your time. Thank you.